I'm Dr. Allie Weiser. I am a licensed psychologist and I'm also the resources manager at the newly renamed National Alliance for Eating Disorders. We were the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness, but a few weeks ago we um, had a name change. So if any of you are all familiar with us, maybe we have a different name now um, to encompass all the services that we provide across the country. Before I get started, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the services the Alliance offers, and then we'll get into our presentation. Um, so the National Alliance for Eating Disorders, we are the leading national nonprofit organization dedicated to providing programs and activities aimed at outreach, education, and early intervention for all eating disorders. We, are in, we have developed the largest free database for um, eating disorder clinicians and eating disorder treatment centers. So that's www.findedhelp.com. Um, through this website, you can find an eating disorder therapist, dietitian, psychiatrist, medical doctor, um, and also all the treatment programs across the country and their different levels of care. So you can go in this search um, with using your zip code. You can search uh, eating disorder diagnosis, uh, insurance that you have, um, any other comorbid diagnoses you can select and it can populate with some different providers or different programs. It's a really amazing resource. So if you are a clinician and you need um, and you need to find um, a client some support, this is a way you can go through findedhelp.com or if you're a parent or someone experiencing an eating disorder, this is a great resource to use. It's free to use and it always will be. Allie, I just wanted to speak up real fast and let you know that we can only see slide 68 and it doesn't look like it's in the presentation view. Okay, thank you for letting me know. Let's see. Let's try this again. Let's try it this way. Is this better? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for letting me know so early on so I can get halfway through. Um, sorry about that, everyone. So this is describing the Alliance. And then I was just sharing about findedhelp.com. This is what it looks like. Um, definitely a good resource to have. It's also an app on um, Apple and Android phones. So you can just put in findedhelp.com or findedhelp within the app stores. We also have a toll-free helpline, um, which is run by myself and other licensed clinicians. So if you ever need any support or education, just curious about if um, your loved one has an eating disorder or if what you're seeing looks like an eating disorder, um, or if you ever need referrals to any local resources or treatment centers, please reach out. We are here to support, um, support you and we are open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5.30. Um, if you do reach out, we do our best to get back to you as quickly as possible. So this is our toll-free helpline um, for you to all know about. We also have weekly virtual therapist-led support groups. Prior to the pandemic, we had 24 in-person support groups across the country. Uh, because of the pandemic, we had to switch into virtual groups. Um, we do have groups for adults who are experiencing an eating disorder or recovering from an eating disorder, any disordered behaviors. Um, these are on Mondays and Saturdays. We also have a support group for um, anyone in recovery in the LGBTQ plus community. And then an important one is a friends and family support group. So these are for um, loved ones of individuals currently experiencing or recovering from an eating disorder. They are very psych like educational. There's a lot of families and friends that have gone through this before, so they will um, come on and share um, share helpful advice. Um, it's the, the cool thing about our groups are they're run by therapists, so they're um, facilitated by therapists, and they will make sure that your questions get answered. Um, and for the pro recovery groups, they make sure that they're safe and they're not triggering for anyone. Who has an eating disorder. So all these links can be found on our website under uh, virtual groups. And these are open to anybody. We have people on here that have joined from across the world. Um, we've been in 57 states, I mean 57 countries um, have joined. Um, so they're pretty amazing and a really good resource to know about. 
So now we'll get started into talking about eating disorders, the latest information you need to know. And I've geared a lot of it um, towards families and towards parents. So um, let's get started. I first wanted to start off um, before we're jumping into before jumping into the presentation, what is an eating disorder? There are a lot of misconceptions about eating disorders, maybe a lot of confusion on what an eating disorder actually is. So just to put it relatively simply, eating disorders are brain-based, biological, complex mental illnesses. Um, what I mean by brain-based is there is a genetic component to an eating disorder, and we'll get more into that. Um, what I mean by biological is that there are um, physical complications and uh, physical negative physical complications or physical effects of eating disorders. And what I mean by complex mental illness is that it's often comorbid with other mental health diagnoses, which we'll get into as well. Uh, so how an eating disorder presents um, and how it manifests is someone may present with a disturbance in their thoughts or feelings or behaviors around food, eating, exercise, or body shape and size. Um, for someone without an eating disorder, it may, it, it, it doesn't make logical sense, maybe some of their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, so it can be hard to understand um, if you're not, if you don't have lived experience or struggled with an eating disorder. Um, and so, like I said, this is a mental illness, and with an eating disorder, someone's ability to function is really affected. So an eating disorder, the eating disorder thoughts and feelings and behaviors take up a lot of someone with an, a lot of an individual's headspace. So they're, this is something that's constantly on their mind. It, so it really interferes um, with their ability to maintain friendships, to um, maintain their career or academics or life goals. And so it's something to be note, there's a spectrum of disordered eating and eating disorder. Um, so an eating disorder really impacts someone's entire life and really um, makes, makes life really challenging for someone with an eating disorder. Also with an eating disorder, it may, what will present is someone will develop rigid rules about what and when to eat, as well as how much to eat. Um, and this leads to significant emotional distress. There's a lot of anxiety around food choices, a lot of anxiety around when to eat, what to eat. Um, and when they do eat, there's, there's backlash. So there's, we call it an eating disorder voice in their head, which it's not external. It's their, it's a voice, their own voice. Um, kind of like the voice, if you ever have made a mistake and you say like, oh, I'm such an idiot. That's the voice they have in their head, but it's a thousand times stronger. We have someone who described the eating disorder voice as an incredible Hulk. Like there's a lot of, um, backlash when, someone doesn't follow, when, when the person doesn't follow the rules that they have created. So these are really distressing. Um, hopefully that kind of can clarify a little bit about what eating disorders are before we jump into some, some more information. So throughout the presentation, you're gonna see some truths. Um, like I said, there's a lot of misconceptions about eating disorders. And so a leading researcher in the field, Cindy Bulick, developed these nine truths about eating disorders and the nonprofits in the eating disorder world have adopted these truths to really share um, and educate and to combat the stigma about eating disorders. So truth number one is eating disorders are not choices, but serious biologically influenced illnesses. So no one wakes up in sunny South Florida or sunny Hawaii or wherever you are. Um, no one wakes up and decides, I wanna have an eating disorder. They are really something that happens to somebody, not something that they would choose. We know that every 52 minutes, someone dies as a direct result from suffering an eating disorder. And we don't put this here to scare you or shock you, but to really show how, how serious eating disorders are. And it's often not talked about, it's not talked about nearly enough. So it's important to know um, kind of the severity of eating disorders, and that's 10,200 deaths per year. The occurrence of eating disorders is growing in leaps and bounds across all countries, all social classes. Um, we know eating disorders are more common than autism and Alzheimer's disease, more deadly than prostate and melanoma cancer, and more costly than depression and anxiety. And this is significant because like I said, we don't really 
talk a lot about eating disorders where it's not commonly heard of, um, but we do know that they are, they're out there and they're really highly prevalent. 28.8 million Americans will experience an eating disorder in their lifetime, which is 9% of the U.S. population. That is a really big number. So it's likely that someone you know, or you, or a friend of a friend has experienced an eating disorder. Um, and we put these other diagnoses up here. So major depressive disorder, something we hear about pretty commonly, 6.7% uh, of the population experiences major depressive disorder. Um, with OCD, 1% of the population experiences OCD. Um, and not that these, these are also serious um, mental health illnesses that need to be taken, taken seriously, but just to kind of show how many people are living with an eating disorder and how it's really not talked about. So this affects the eating disorder community a lot. Um, we are very underfunded in terms of research money for eating disorders. If you look at this graph, you can see um, 30 million people experience an eating disorder and we get $32 million in research money. So that's about a dollar per person um, in terms of funding. And if you look at something like Alzheimer's disease, which again is a serious illness and very important for research funding, 5.7 million individuals experience Alzheimer's disease and they get $1.36 billion. Um, this is this really impacts a lot um, in terms of eating disorder treatment. A lot of our treatment, I mean, a lot of our research has been done um, in um, treatment, the uh, residential treatment centers, which those people that are in those centers have uh, have access to care, um, which we know that since eating disorders affect everyone, um, it's the people that are underserved and don't have access to care, there's not research on this population. So we are really limited in terms of our research and you may see some statistics throughout here that are seem outdated, um, but that's because we, are, we have limited research and there's more to be coming, which is great, but near, not nearly enough. Truth number two is an eating disorder diagnosis is a health crisis that wreaks havoc on an individual's personal and family functioning. So an eating disorder will drive a wedge between families and um, all parts of someone's life, sort of like I talked about on that first slide. So how does an eating disorder develop? Um, we know that genes and environment both play an import, important roles in the development of eating disorders. So we think that genes load the gun by creating, so we know genes load the gun and then something in the environment pulls the trigger. So we'll go a little bit more into those environmental factors, but in terms of genetics, uh, 50 to 80% of the risks for anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa is genetic. And there's more research coming out that for binge eating disorder, there's also a genetic component. Um, this statistic is, or this, this data is really important and to share with clients, to share with clients, family members, because a lot of times they, people even who have an eating disorder say, why would I choose this for myself? Why did I do this? And it's so important to point out that you didn't choose this. 50 to 80% of the risk for this was genetic and then something in the environment happened that offset the development of an eating disorder. Um, so we know there's not just one gene that's, um, anorexia or bulimia or eating disorder, it's really a variation of different genes that contribute to these traits that either increase the risk, increase or decrease the risk for eating disorder. So common traits that you might see um, that are genetic are perfectionism, drive for thinness, anxiety. So it's really a combination of these different genes that come together to um, develop the uh, predisposition for an eating disorder. So we know genes alone do not predict who will develop an eating disorder. Um, something in the environment usually contributes to the development of an eating disorder. Um, and just because someone does have the genetic predisposition doesn't mean that they're going to develop an eating disorder. Uh, some of the, this is not an exhaustive list of different contributing factors, but just some ones to touch on. Um, puberty is a very vulnerable time for uh, children and adolescents um, within that time frame children are gonna gain 40 plus pounds. Um, there's a lot of bodily changes, hormonal changes, 
and that can be um, a risk factor for the development of an eating disorder, especially when we know that the number one cause of bullying in children and adolescents and maybe even in adults is um, teasing about somebody's body size or body shape. So puberty can be um, a really hard, a hard time for individuals um, if they have the predisposition for an eating disorder. We also know our environment can contribute to the development of an eating disorder. We very much live in a culture where there is um, a focus on thin idealization and there's a lot of weight stigma shaming individuals because of their body size. Um, the media, which we'll get into, often promotes diets. We call um, the environment is very much a diet culture. There's, if you are driving, when I'm driving to work, the amount of um, radio ads I hear about weight loss or juice cleanses, it's, it's really ridiculous and I always turn them off, but these are messages that we are all hearing and we are all taking in um, so it's important to be aware of those messages that we hear. Um, in terms of children and adolescents, comments and bullying from peers, comments from family members or coaches, um, comments from healthcare providers. If a healthcare provider tells um, a child that they're overweight or that they need to watch what they're eating, something that children remember this and it, it can really um, offset that development of an eating disorder if someone does have that genetic predisposition. Also any activity where weight regulation is demanded. So I think of um, like wrestling, cheerleading, figure skating. If there's a focus on um, cutting weight or if just focus on body size in that activity, that can be a contributing factor. Um, we have vegetarianism on here. Um, with an asterisk to note that people who are vegetarian don't necessarily have eating disorders. Um, this is really something that's important to know is um, being a vegetarian or being a vegan or being on X diet um, can be a socially acceptable way for someone to hide behind an eating disorder. So if a child or if your child or adolescent is or even adult decides all of a sudden that they're going to be vegetarian, it's something to really be um, look out and just be curious of why this came up um, and just to know that this can be a socially acceptable way to hide behind um, an eating disorder. So it's important to know that families are not to blame and we'll get that get into that later, but families aren't to blame for an eating disorder. So that's, I don't want that to come across with this slide. Um, but it can be important to think about your family and what are the beliefs that your family have about body size or how um, the comments that are made in the home about body size or are there teasing in the home? Um, because families really affect how we think we should look and act um, by making comments about their own appearance or comments about um, the child's appearance. Uh, there's a lot of modeling that goes on in the homes and if there's discussion around dieting or teasing others for appearance that could be kind of harmful to a child or to anybody um, but these these messages are often passed down from families so there's no shame or blame if if maybe this is something that comes up in the home just something to be aware of and think about maybe how we can make some changes um, but on the other hand if um, there's a lot of like body acceptance or body positivity or not really a focus on body size in the home. That can be a really good protective factor. Um, and we also know culture impacts body image in many ways. Um, so in terms of family, if um, you're depending on your family culture, there could be conflicting cultural messages regarding the ideal body compared to um, what is um, what society believes is the ideal body. There may be conflicting messages as um, if you grew up in a home, there may be messages. And um, now if your child is like a first generation American, they may or have assimilated into another culture, there can be conflicting messages about what the ideal body is. Um, any membership in minority groups, um, people have reported, um, people of color have reported feeling unsafe in their body and wanted to change their body to conform to um, the, the majority culture. Um, any experience of oppression or discrimination, prejudice, 
that could impact how someone feels in their body and um, also any focus on high achievement or perfectionism that can impact body image as well. And like I said, just thinking about this and how body image, the important thing is to just think about how body image and how talk about dieting and bodies is in your home or in your culture and just being curious about that. So also wanted to touch on the media um, because I said the media can be a contributing factor to the development of an eating disorder if there is a predisposition for an eating disorder. Um, but there are many harmful messages that are in the media and once you start seeing them, you won't be able to stop seeing them, I promise. So it's something to be looking out for. Um, if you just think of this first um, advertisement for the Axe body spray, what message does that give, does that give us? Um, to me, it looks like um, obviously a thin, more muscular body physique is, is better, is what's attractive, what's, what's ideal. Um, it's saying maybe that someone in a larger body is unhygienic, hairy, um, and if you buy this product, you will, you'll be more like the ideal body size. And it's also saying um, you shouldn't want to be like that one. You should want to as aspire to be like the attractive um, physique, the thinner male. Um, so just noting what, what messages are being portrayed to, to us and especially children. Children are really, um, really vulnerable to these as well. Another thing is um, Photoshop. These, these pictures on the bottom, um, but this was two models. They identify as plus size models and they wanted to show um, what, the, what happens with airbrush and how, and how people can alter their pictures and you have no idea. So if you look, they made themselves smaller, they, skip, they smoothed over their skin, um, they made their self conform to what society views as views as attractive or views as an ideal body size. So this can be really scary because kids are constantly scrolling through social media, constantly looking at advertisements and they're comparing themselves. So it's important for children to know and for us to know that what we're seeing is likely not, not real. Um, and there's a lot of photo editing and altering and these are things, these are body sizes and types that are impossible to get to and they're really unrealistic. Um, so it's important to, to teach our kids that and to even be aware of this ourselves. Um, and again, just the marketing messages that, that occur, like you can never be too thin. So paying attention to these messages that um, is, are out there in the media is, is really important. You know, social media has some benefits of keeping people connected, um, but there is also a dark side of social media, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, but in terms of body image and eating disorders and diet culture, social media is flooded with diet culture. It's flooded with really unhealthy, um, unhealthy accounts. There's a lot of focus on um, different fitness accounts or maybe diet culture messages um, that show healthy eating and healthy exercise behaviors. And these can be really, really dangerous because one, um, there's no one size fits all way of eating or moving for anybody. And to these, these individuals who are putting on these videos or posting these stories, or um, they're usually not fitness, they're usually not um, medical doctors, they're not registered dietitians, they're just your everyday human. Um, and there's no warning or disclaimer for the potential health risks associated with these fitness accounts. Um, so if, if kids or even adults try to emulate what they're seeing in these accounts, it can be really, really dangerous. A lot of them are very restrictive or encouraging really unhealthy behaviors. Um, also these inspirational photos of before and after pictures of different body sizes can be really, really harmful um, and can encourage viewers to participate in unhealthy behaviors, especially if they're aspiring to be like one of the pictures or one of the people that they're following. So it's important to reduce negative media exposure um, with kids and, and in, in your household. So being aware of what media you're looking at, because our children are, are always observing, they're always watching, they're always listening. 
Um, it's also important to know what social media sites your child is using and, and what they're doing on these sites. I know that can be really hard to monitor since there are so many different social media sites, but it's definitely something important to talk to your kids about and, and expressing why you're concerned about different social media sites and um, just giving them the education on this as well. So educating on how this content can be harmful and also setting some parameters around media use. Just like I had shared um, those pictures and showed of the Photoshop and of the like advertisements, it's important to educate children on this, on these distortions and what harmful media content is so they can look out for it. Um, at the Alliance, we do a lot of community presentations in schools and this is something that uh, we always teach children and adolescents in our presentations. Um, also important to show examples of how the ideal body shape has changed over time. Um, so what their what the body ideal body type is now is likely going to be different in a few years. Um, if you can think about it, um, years ago the a curvy body was was idealized, and then it became a thin body, and then it, then it just changes all the time. Um, so to strive for this ideal body type is really silly because it's one it's going to change, and two it's really unrealistic. Um, we are all born with a set point and what our body is supposed to look like. And it's really unhelpful to try to change that body shape and size, which goes against everything that diet culture kind of tells us. Um, it can also be helpful to look through social media together and discuss those subtle messages that are coming up. Um, once, so the way social media works is through algorithms. So if, um, if someone does look up weight loss or a diet or something, social media, the algorithm will make it so these things show up on their feed more. So it can be something to talk to, the, like scroll through with them, see what's coming up, let's see the subtle messaging and also try to work it so the algorithm changes. Um, also substituting positive for negative. So instead of saying you can no longer have Instagram or whatever, help them follow more body positive accounts, help them follow more body acceptance accounts or um, diversify their feed with all body shapes and sizes, all colors, all genders, um, not, ha not having their feeds kind of this one ideal body type or because um, that can be really harmful. So now we'll kind of go back to eating disorders. So Eating disorder is eating an eating disorder is the tip of the iceberg. So what you see are the behaviors, the eating disorder behaviors. So um, that can be we'll go into it a little more too, but like restricting or controlling their food or focusing on their um, diet or increased exercise routines. That's what we see on the outside. Um, but what's really happening is underneath the eating disorder are a multi, could be a multitude of things. Um, anxiety, depression, trauma, family issues, um, personality disorders, substance use disorder. So really those are what's driving the eating disorder behaviors. Eating disorders are a maladaptive way of coping with those underlying issues. And um, often when people present to treatment, they, may deny that they have an eating disorder, they may only focus on those underlying issues, but sometimes they come in and they only focus on the eating disorder and the eating disorder has been kind of numbing out the anxiety and numbing out the depression or the trauma um, that is really driving the eating disorder. So once we start working on the eating disorder, those underlying issues usually pop, pop right up. So when treating an eating disorder, it's important to be able to work with um, all different types of uh, mental health um, diagnoses and all different types of just things that can contribute to an eating disorder. And we know that um, a majority of the eating disorders, I don't have an exact number, are pre preceded by an anxiety disorder. So usually when people look back, um, it, they realize that they struggled with anxiety disorder as a child or anxiety their, their whole life, and it can kind of um, or like mold into an eating disorder because the eating disorder is used to cope with the anxiety. So we know that eating disorders, like I said, display substantial comorbidity with other mental health disorders. Um, a mom in our group call, calls 
um, an eating disorder, the carpool illness. So it's like the eating disorder is driving the car and it's never driving alone. There's usually anxiety in the backseat, depression, um, just like I shared with the iceberg, but I, I like um, I like using the carpool, carpool disease um, imagery as well. Um, and while we know that eating disorders coexist with other mental health disorders, eating disorders often go undiagnosed and untreated. This is for many reasons. One is the shame and stigma um, with eating disorders. Someone will, might present to their provider and say, talk about their anxiety, talk about their depression, but there's a lot of shame with eating disorders. Um, they, or they may not want to give up their eating disorder because sometimes it feels um, very egocentric and feels like it's actually helping them. So they may not disclose that. Another reason is because of our limited like research and just still the stigma that's out there. Um, many providers aren't trained in how to assess for eating disorders. In my doctoral program, I think I got maybe one lesson on just the eating disorder diagnoses and, and that was it. And it's true for the medical community that they're not getting trained in what eating disorders are and how to effectively assess for eating disorders. So a lot of times when people go into their primary care, a provider who could recognize an eating disorder, they, the, the provider doesn't because they don't know how to assess. And then they also don't know what to do um, if, an, if there is an eating disorder, they don't know how to treat it. Um, so a low number of individuals actually obtain treatment for their eating disorder. And our numbers for how many eating disorders there are and they, they could actually be higher just because of this, um, because of what I just talked about. So truth number five, this is a very important one. So despite the archaic stereotype um, that eating disorders affect um, like thin adolescent, high socioeconomic status um, females, we know that eating disorders affect people of all genders, ages, races, ethnicities, body shapes and weights, sexual orientations and socioeconomic statuses. So eating disorders affect everyone across the board all cultures. Um, and on the research that has been done, which like I said, we need a ton more, um, they have found no significant differences in overall prevalence of eating disorders across ethnic, ethnic groups. So the archaic, archaic stereotypes that um, it would often, in the media it's often portrayed as, as white women and usually adolescents. Um, but on the research in Asian Americans, they have actually found that there's no significant difference. I mean, there's no differences in body dissatisfaction between Asian Americans and white Americans. And we actually know that there's higher rates of thin idealization um, in Asian Americans compared to white Americans and, and black American females. Research has also found, um, so let me back up. Um, there was this stereotype that eating disorders didn't affect um, black women because their body size, there's a different body idealization, um, but we know that that's not true. Um, black Americans are at similar risk of developing eating disorders and um, they're actually less likely to get diagnosed with anorexia nervosa and may suffer for longer periods of time, um, even if they've been experiencing anorexia nervosa. And now this could be because people aren't assessing if um, a black woman comes or even a black male comes into their office and they have this idea that eating disorders only affects a certain population, they might not be assessing, might not ever even come up as a question. Um, we also know that recurrent binge, binge eating is more common am among black women compared to white women. And we know that in, with Hispanic and Latino women, they have similar or higher prevalence of eating disorders compared to white women. Now this research, I know I'm talking a lot about women, but that's just where this research is. Eating disorders do affect men and we'll get into that, but um, I just wanted to point that out because a lot of this, this is like the limited research that we do have and it's only geared towards women, um, but it's not accurate of, of what's really going on. Um, and we know that experiences of racism, um, trauma, that racism is a trauma, um, acculturative stress and other race related trauma influence how people of color exist in their bodies. Um, so they are um, definitely at risk for the development of an eating disorder. It's like I said, eating disorders are maladaptive ways of coping. So if someone does experience trauma, 
because of the body that they're, because of their race or because of their culture. Um, an eating disorder can be a way to numb out those feelings or, or can be a way to cope with those feelings. The current research that we have now shows that men represent approximately a quarter of all the eating disorder cases. I believe this number is higher. Um, I do the referrals for the Alliance and we get so many calls for, for sons, for men, for males, for um, with eating disorders. And it'll be interesting as the research comes out in the future, um, what that number looks like. But again, males are, men are, um, there's a stigma um, a stigma on even asking for any help. So to be to come out and um, ask for help for an eating disorder can be really scary, especially when there's that belief that it only affects women. So um, I believe that number is actually quite higher. Um, but we know that hospitalizations for men has increased 53% um, from 1999 to 2009. So for eating disorders. Um, Eating disorders are also highly prevalent in the LGBTQ plus community. We actually know in the LGBTQ plus community, they're at higher risk for eating disorders. Um, beginning as early as 12, gay, lesbian, and bisexual teens may be at higher risk of binge eating and purging compared to their heterosexual peers. And we know transgender students are four times more likely to report an eating disorder diagnosis compared to their cisgender heterosexual female peers. Um, if you think what it's like to to be um, a part of the LGBTQ plus community, there's a lot of oppression. Um, there's also can be discomfort in disconnect between um, one's body and um, and their mind or how they feel in their body. So there can be use a lot of eating disorder behaviors to um, stop growing or to to not go through puberty. Um, like I said, eating disorders are very complex and multifaceted. But that's just some of the some of the data that we have. I like this cartoon even though, I mean, I like this cartoon just because it, anyone in this picture could have an eating disorder or or no one in this picture could have an eating disorder. You cannot tell who has an eating disorder and um, they affect, like I said, all role, all race, cultures, gender identity, abilities and disabilities and ethnicity. So I think that's something really important as a takeaway for today. Um, so, there has been trend like increased trends in eating disorders and um, like I've been talking about there's this, the the belief that if eating disorders affect just younger women and males um, but one of the highest actually the highest increase in eating disorders that we have seen are women in mid, from mid, women in midlife um, so from hospitalizations for patients age 45 to 65 had the greatest increase out of all age groups um, and 85% of these cases were female identified patients. So why is that? There are some, some triggers. So it could either be um, an eating disorder that wasn't treated years prior. I've had clients come in at 55 years old and they've been struggling their whole life and have never had the eating disorder diagnosis. Um, so that can be a reason, but there's also this desire. Our culture doesn't let women age gracefully. Um, you can see in that picture, men don't age better than women. They're just allowed to age. Women are, there's a, um, this belief that we must remain young and youthful. And um, that can be really triggering as women are aging. We also know that the divorce rate is super high in the U.S. So women are getting back out in, in the dating world. And um, this could be a trigger to um, change their appearance, change their body, um, to, to feel more attractive going on dates um, and meeting new people. They also experience empty nest, nest syndrome, so a lot of changes in their environment. They may experience losses of their spouse or parents or children. Um, they're also in that sandwich generation, so having to take care of family, parents, and their children. There's a lot of stressors, so this can be um, a, a big trigger for the development of an eating disorder or the um, if eating disorder has already been prior in the past, it can be a trigger for the eating disorder to sort of come back. So in terms of children, we know that there was a 72% increase in hospitalizations for children under the age of 12 from 1999 to 2009. Um, this is a really scary statistic that nearly half of three to six-year-old girls report that they worry about being fat 
Um, there is more research on even even um, young young boys that worry about being fat because um, we live in a society that is very scared of people like very scared of gaining weight or being fat. It's it's something that's demonized in our society and children are listening and they're hearing these messages as well. So it's something again to be aware of um, when you're talking about diets and um, body sizes. So we also know um, that parents or doctors can, can, like I said, can say things to the children of maybe your, your BMI is overweight or you need to watch what you're eating and all this stuff. And parents or family members or whoever, or teachers in schools, um, they can kind of um, can poke fun at children for their body size and tease them about their body size or really focus on their body size. And we know that weight teasing doesn't do any good at all. Um, it doesn't motivate anyone any at all. It actually predicts weight gain, it predicts binge eating, and it um, kind of encourages them to go through to extreme weight control measures. So weight teasing is something that is really harmful. Um, and like I said earlier, we know bullying is the number one, I mean, we know body size is the number one cause of bullying. Um, so something to be aware of. And um, we have obesity education in schools here um, because that has been over the past few years, something that schools have really focused on. And although it was well-intentioned, it really did does more harm than good. Um, the thing with obesity education is the, the idea that children should move more and eat less, um, eat healthier, quote unquote, healthier foods. Um, and they're really missing the mark on why that underlying, the underlying emotions associated um, with maybe why um, someone is in a larger body that doesn't take in th the genetics. Um, it doesn't take into account um, like what's going on at home is there when they're home is there a lack of access to food and so when they're in school or when they have access to food they may be engaging in binging um, or they may be hoarding food because um, of the lack of access so obesity education while it was well intentioned of like move your body and and eat less um, it's really simplified and, and not not helpful um, so it's something to be aware of and if you do work in a school, um, what the what the education is in the school and and how maybe we can alter that to be more be more aware of um, what you're learning. And the Alliance is always here to do presentations to educate um, if, if needed. So we know that singling out children um, in larger bodies for weight related interventions in schools increases both anxiety for the child and stigmatization, prejudice, and harassment towards the child. I've had clients come in and say that they remember when they were in school, they lined all the students up and told everybody their weights out loud. Um, and that was just extremely harmful, um, not even just for a kid in a larger body, but for children of all sizes, um, really focusing on children's body weight and not focusing on um, them being happy and social and healthy kids, it's, it's really um, does more harm than good and increases, like I said, increases anxiety and stigma um, and harassment towards the child. So I just want to take a pause and see if any questions have come. I'll have to stop sharing because I can't see anybody, um, but I can stop sharing and or if somebody wants to read me the questions that come in, I'll, I'll stop sharing and, and see. We do not, I do not see any questions, but you guys, if okay. you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Does anyone have questions at this time? And you also, if you don't feel like typing in the chat, you probably can unmute yourself in order to um, ask a question. Yeah, and I'll save time for the end for questions. Okay. All right, so I'll keep going and then we'll say, pause at the end. Um, so I'm just going to go through okay, some so of I, One oh, question that just come up real quick. Can you hear me? 
Yep, I can hear you. Okay, so it says, is there a relationship between eating disorders and sensory disorders? Um, so we're going to talk about that actually shortly. Um, there is, um, in terms of like autism, spe autism spectrum disorder, where there's a lot of sensory sensitivities or sensory issues, we do see um, eating disorders develop, but we'll get to that shortly. Good question. Okay, I don't see anything else. Okay. And if I don't answer that question throughout the presentation, we can go back to it at the end. Um, so just a few of the kind of the eating disorders. This one, anorexia nervosa, is probably the most commonly known eating disorder. It's not the most common, but most commonly known. Um, anorexia is a self-imposed starvation resulting from a distorted body image and intense fear of gaining weight. So what you see in this cartoon is actually what someone with anorexia nervosa experiences. They see themselves in a much larger body than they actually are. And this can be due to the disorder itself, but also because of the malnourishment. Um, they have a lot of distorted perception of what they, they look like. Um, there are two types of anorexia nervosa. Uh, the, there's the restricting type. This is someone who will um, be constantly dieting, have a really restrictive diet, um, and engage in um, just fasting, restrictive rules, or excessive exercise. Um, there's a misconception that people with anorexia nervosa don't eat. They actually do eat, they just don't eat enough to maintain a healthy body weight. Um, and then there's the binge eating purging type. This is when someone um, with an someone who's restricting will um, engage in a self-perceived binge and then uh, purge or get rid of the food by vomiting or use of laxatives, enemas or diuretics. Um, and because of these behaviors, it carries a greater medical risk. Um, something to point out is with some with anorexia nervosa, they, I said a self-perceived binge, um, binge eating. To someone with anorexia nervosa, um, it could be they eat four blueberries and that is really scary to them and they perceive that as a binge. Um, so for anorexia nervosa binge eating purging type, the, the binge eating wouldn't be um, what someone, like someone without an eating disorder would probably classify as a binge. Truth number six is that eating disorders carry an increased risk for both suicide and medical complications. Um, eating disorders have eating disorders have really high rates of um, high mortality rates. We know that anorexia nervosa has the second highest mortality rate among all psychiatric illnesses. It actually was the highest um, up until maybe last year um, or the year before um, opioid addiction became the highest. Um, but it's just interesting to think about because we hear a lot about the opioid epidemic, which is very serious, but we don't hear about um, eating disorder epidemic or anything like that. But eating disorders um, have high mortality rates. There's a lot of medical complications. And um, if someone isn't nourishing their body, which malnourishment happens not just in anorexia nervosa, but in all eating disorders, um, it really impacts the different organs, the muscles, um, can cause a heart to stop. There's a lot of different um, complications with eating disorders that can contribute to, to death. Um, we know that 10 to 20% will die from a direct result of their eating disorder. And this number actually could be higher. Uh, we don't know, it's just how deaths, how someone's death gets classified. If they, they could die from cardiac arrest or even die um, from organ failure and it doesn't get marked as an eating disorder. So this number could actually be higher than we, than we know. Another um, commonly known eating disorder is bulimia nervosa. And this is when an individual engages in episodes of binging. Um, so for this binging would be to take in a lot of food um, and then purging, getting rid of the food. So bulimia nervosa is really this cycle. So someone can start with, um, they want to change their, their body size, they want to change their diet, um, and so they engage in these strict rigid rules, strict dieting, and because our bodies need all foods, our bodies need all different macronutrients, 
Um, and if simply if we tell ourselves we can't have something, we want it more. Um, so there's a lot of tension and cravings. And then because their bodies are so hungry from the restriction, they'll often engage in a binge um, binge eating episode, which is really feels really out of control um, for them. It can be um, they can take in up to fifty thousand. Sorry, um, they can take in up to fifty thousand calories um, in a whole cycle. I think someone's um, microphone is on. If you want to turn off oh, the microphone. Well, I have two meetings for this thing, but the first one was good. Matt and Karen have been thinking the same stuff. I can't see whose microphone is on. But if well, you can turn the microphone. Or if someone can well, share. Looks like Deb Cavett. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I was saying, um, when someone engages in binge eating, it. they can. Superfluous hierarchy. Superfluous hierarchy can be toxic. That's true. I'm trying to see if I can mute her, but I can't. You know, a cliff that makes her higher up in the hierarchy. Deb, can you meet me? Self-made. Anyway, yeah, it's been really bothering Pat, too, because he's one of the ones that's not in that group. Deb, is there, is that, okay. Which doesn't even make sense. I can't see their name. I think you said Deb. Is there, yes. Yes. whatever. Deb. Anyway, Deb. Karen, I'm glad we brought it up. Are you sleeping? Have you been sleeping? Okay. I. As a host, can you. Let me see. Oh, let me see. I'm, I'm, oh, let me. Calvin's cute. Um, Calvin's a cutie. Where are. He's a good boy. <laughs> let me see. I did. Um, it. You got it? Yep. Okay. Okay. Sorry I'm about back. that. That's okay. Um, do, where, how do I play this slide? How do I play the slide from here? Oh. Oh no. I'm sorry. We will get back to this shortly. Okay. Slideshow. There we go. Present from current slide. Okay. So, sorry about that. Um, the bulimia. There's a cycle, and I was at the binge eating part. Um, it really feels out of control for the person. Um, like sorry, I said, they Allie, can... um, you're not in the um, slideshow presentation. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm so okay. sorry. No I've problem. Been... I'm gonna mute everyone and then unmute you. I muted. Okay. You good? Perfect. Allie, you're muted now. Mute. I am unmuting, unmuted. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to share it. Let's Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. There you go. Okay. All right. Um, they really want us to present this slide, I guess. But um, 
with bulimia nervosa, after there's been someone engages in binging, they'll engage in purging, which means um, to get rid of, to avoid, to avoid weight gain. Um, so a purging behavior could be self-induced vomiting, laxatives, diuretics, um, excessive exercise. And then with this, there's a lot of shame and disgust, and then um, a lot of self-blame, a lot of self-critical thoughts. So they'll start that dieting restrictive cycle all over again. Um, so it's a really hard cycle to get out of without professional help. Um, one of the most common uh, purging behaviors is laxative abuse. And um, when someone is engaging in laxative abuse, they're not just taking the prescribed dose, they're taking 50 to 100 times the prescribed dose. Um, their body develops a tolerance and then um, they will just continue to take more and more. And there's, as you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, medical complications that come with laxative abuse. Um, and then individuals who do use laxatives uh, tend to have uh, more pathology and more and other, um, other mental health diagnoses, um, the anxiety, depression, substance use, but they tend to have more pathological um, behaviors. Truth number seven, another really important, um, they're all important, but another takeaway is that many people with eating disorders look healthy, yet they may be extremely ill. So that stereotypical idea of what an eating disorder looked like, uh, that thin, emaciated body, only 6% of eating, um, only 6% of um, eating disorders, there's only 6% of the, are represented, okay, saying the wrong things, but 6% of individuals with eating disorders will actually be in um, a, that size body. So um, you can't tell who has an eating disorder based on what they look like. Um, and this is not only just their physical body, it's also how they present. They can be the, they can appear really happy, really high achieving, um, really funny and intelligent, but internally they may be really ill and be really struggling um, mentally and emotionally with an eating disorder. So this is the most common eating disorder, binge eating disorder. Um, this is when someone engages in episodes of binge eating. Um, without the purging behavior of bulimia nervosa. Um, with binge eating disorder, um, they typically can um, consume like 2,000, 5,000 calories in one sitting because they're not getting rid of the food, um, but it's a similar cycle to bulimia nervosa. They will be on a restrictive diet, um, have the overwhelming urge to eat, engage in a binge, feel really out of control and ashamed, and then start that diet again. Um, and get stuck in this cycle. Like I said, this is the most common eating disorder in US adults. Um, it's more common than as anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa combined times three. So that is um, a lot more common. Um, and it occurs at similar rates across cultures, races, and ethnicities. And like I said, there's also research that has come out that um, shows there's a genetic influence and that the binge eating disorder runs in the family. Um, some signs and symptoms of binge eating disorder, there's a loss of control over food. So um, food is, it's, is often used as a drug. Um, food is a way to stuff or to numb down, numb out emotions. If you ever think of a time where you overate, um, maybe ate more than you wanted to eat and you're really full, that's really all you can think about. Um, that's sort of what happens subconsciously with binge eating disorder. It's a way to self-medicate and to numb out um, whatever is going on, or it can even be a way to, to punish someone if they um, like self-punishment as well. Um, and I, I went over this in, with a binge, so I'll eat much more rapidly than normal, feel really uncomfortably full. Um, they may not, individuals may not even remember what they ate. It, it just feels really, um, really out of control and chaotic for them. And um, I think something that's important to know, because um, it's not often talked about, is that binge eating disorder often typically starts with restriction. Um, and so if you think about if someone goes into a doctor's office and the doctor says, you need to lose weight and an individual decides to start, start restricting um, to, to lose weight, they, if they have um, binge eating disorder, if they're predisposed to binge eating disorder, that can be very triggering. Um, so any sort of restrictive behaviors can um, offset 
binge eating disorder. So another, uh, this is a new, a newer a new diagnosis in the DSM-5, but it's definitely not a new presentation. They just finally have a name for it. Um, with its avoidant restrictive food intake disorder known as ARFID. Um, this is commonly seen in children and more commonly seen in boys, um, but it does um, impact adults as well. Um, it typically presents in childhood and adolescence, um, but again, it can affect um, adults as well. So with ARFID, there's really someone is struggling um, significantly with food. They may be restrictive, restrictive with food or have really, really um, restrictive, limited diets of what they will eat. They can look like picky eating um, and there's no concern around weight or body image. So that's what sort of sets ARFID apart from the other diagnoses. There's not um, a focus on weight or body size. Um, and in kids, like, like I said, this can present as picky eating and sometimes they'll be told they'll grow out of it, but these, these, these folks don't grow out of the picky eating. Um, and this can lead to different nutrition can lead to nutritional deficiencies or failure to thrive or failure to gain um, like failure to gain weight appropriately for their growth chart. Um, ARFID is interesting because it can present in many different ways. Um, so there's different types of ARFID. The avoidant type um, can be related to um, an adverse experience or a fear-based experience. So if someone um, had the experience of choking on a food, um, they may start to um, limit different other types of foods because it, they could be really fearful of choking again. Um, or if there was trauma around a certain food, they may avoid foods. And again, the, the reasoning for the restriction is not because of body weight, it's because these other, um, these sort of traumatic or fear-based experiences. If someone, um, the way it shows up sometimes is if someone was um, got really sick after eating a certain food and maybe had an allergic reaction, they may start wanting to avoid different foods. Um, also, like the question that was asked, there's aversive type, and this is when someone has a limited diet in relation to sensory features. So based on, um, they may avoid certain foods because of the texture, the color, the smell, um, there may be sensory sensitivities. So um, like I said, that can be seen in autism spectrum disorder, and then it also can be seen in someone without autism spectrum disorder, but just different sensory sensitivities. Um, and then you have the, the kid or the adult who just really has no interest in food or eating. So food doesn't, um, may not give some, this, someone who has restrictive type, they don't have pleasure in eating. They just really don't enjoy eating at all. They may forget to eat just because they have no interest in it. Um, so these are, and then there's kind of the mixed type, mixed of these different presentations. Um, but it's important, to, like I said, sometimes parents will be told that it's just picky eating, you'll grow out of it, but use your sense, use your gut if you feel like this is something that is, um, it's something that warrants extra help. It's really important to get, get these kiddos help as soon as possible, because um, there is treatment for ARFID and, and all other eating disorders. Um, the, this is the last category I'll go over in terms of diagnoses, but there's um, other specified feeding or eating disorders known as OSFED. Um, these, this is when there's full criteria, when full criteria for one of the previously um, eating disorder diagnosis is not met. So they have the eating disorder symptoms, but it doesn't meet full criteria for any of the other diagnoses. Um, and it's important to know that these are just as serious and there's just there's significant medical complications with these as well. Um, particularly atypical anorexia nervosa, that is when someone is engaging in all the behaviors as anorexia nervosa, their just body weight um, isn't, isn't significantly low. So they could be in a larger body, be, have lost a significant amount of weight and they're still in a normal size or a larger size body. So they very much have anorexia nervosa is called atypical anorexia nervosa, which is silly because it's, it is anorexia nervosa. And a lot of times these folks don't feel like they deserve help or that they should be getting help because they're not in that emaciated body. But we know that they have just as serious medical complications as anorexia nervosa. Um, and then there's just some others listed here. We could always, if you have any questions about them, we can answer them at the end. 
So some physical, there's gonna be some physical, behavioral, and psychological warning signs that you may see. Um, so some physical warning signs, maybe significant weight fluctuations or significant weight loss. Um, in term, there can be impact to the skin tone. So pale, gaunt, yellowish skin tone. Um, there may be dizziness and fainting spells. Um, in menstruating individuals, there may be a loss of menstrual cycle or maybe never starting a menstrual cycle. Um, in terms of, so um, they could be, there can be a lot of complaints of being cold when the body is malnourished and not getting the nutrients that it needs. It will, um, it will sort of shut down and they, they don't eat enough to maintain body heat. Um, there could be uh, skirt, dental erosion, depending on what eating disorder behaviors are being used. Um, in terms of purging by self-induced vomiting, there may be scars on knuckles, um, dehydration, nutritional deficiency, hair loss. Um, so these are just some warning signs, physical warning signs to look out for. Uh, behaviorally, you may see your child or whoever having a lot of excuses for not eating. They may be really preoccupied with food and calories. They may follow all the, um, I always think of Instagram, but just follow different recipe accounts or they may make food for everyone else but not eat it themselves. Because there's really a preoccupation and obsession with food, especially when there's malnourishment. Um, they may be engaging in excessive or compulsive exercise. Uh, they may engage in secretive eating or missing food, may find, um, food wrappers in their, under their bed or in their room. Um, the, someone may use the bathroom immediately after their meals. Um, so these are some things to look out for, um, to just, if they, they may raise some red flags. Um, if someone exercises when they're sick or injured, or if they get really distressed, if they're not able to do their exercise routine, that could be something, um, any obsessive rituals around food or eating or food preparation. Um, and if someone suddenly just says they don't like the food anymore and they've always enjoyed it and now they're no longer eating some foods because they don't like it, um, any sort of restrictive restriction um, is a warning sign. And it's really important to just be aware of as adolescents, they're growing, their bodies are meant to change. So it's really, really, really dangerous for adolescents to go on a diet at all. Um, so dieting, if they're going on a diet, that definitely could be something to talk to them about and get them support around. Some psychological warning signs, um, they may feel anxious around mealtimes, they may get really distressed, they may not want to come to the dinner table, um, they may feel out of control around food, they may have their own obsession with their body shape, weight, and appearance. You may see significant changes in emotional and psychological states, so depression, stress, anxiety, irritability. Um, if you've ever heard of the term hangry, if you go a long time without eating and accidentally and you are hungry, um, you do get irritable and, and angry and hanger is a very real thing. Um, so because these individuals are often really malnourished, there is a lot of um, irritability and anger. Um, also black and white thinking. So rigid thoughts about foods being good or foods being bad. Those are some warning signs. So I just want to touch on some philosophies to adopt and then hopefully leave some time for questions. Um, we talked about the uh, harm of social media and the different messages that are on there. There is, we definitely live in a culture where clean eating it, or wellness trends are really popular um, and these can be really prob problematic. Um, these terms are ambiguous, left for interpretation. Um, so and there's just a million diets out there, like literally hundreds of thousands of diets out there. Um, so if someone is trying to be well or clean eat, they're gonna, they may um, be really restrictive and um, feel distress and panic if food is not presumed clean enough. Um, and um, there's a diagnosis, or not a diagnosis, but a new a term that we talk about in the eating disorder um, community is orthorexia nervosa. It's not a clinical diagnosis, but it very well, very well may be one day. And it's the obsession with clean eating um, and the obsession with um, 
eating whole foods and it can really become really restrictive and lead to malnutrition and weight loss and um, all the physical complications. So something to adopt and to look into and think about is intuitive eating. Um, as And the, 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 the beliefs around this are um, when we're babies, we know um, when we're hungry and when we're full. If you think about feeding a baby, they tell you when they're when they don't want any more. Um, so it's really, and then, so we really have um, an internal like guide of when we're hungry, when we're full, we trust our bodies as babies. But as we grow up and we hear these diet culture messages or these good foods or bad foods, or maybe um, if you were a part of the clean your plate club, like no matter what your fullness is, doesn't matter. You have to clean your plate before you can get up from the dinner table. That really takes us away, has taken us away from our internal hunger cues. So with intuitive eating, it's really getting back to those internal hunger cues um, and breaking free from those rules and not labeling things as good or bad foods, um, knowing that there's foods that may be more nutritious, but there's a space for those. And there's also a space for play foods, foods that might not be as nutritious, but they, they're they they're good and they're yummy. Um, so, and we can enjoy, we're allowed to enjoy what we eat. So with intuitive eating, it's really getting back to that, um, like list, trusting our bodies. And if you're not in this place, it's totally understandable because we are all in diet culture, but it's definitely something to look into and, and learn more about. Um, because intuitive eating can be very freeing and, and give you freedom from those diet culture rules. Um, with intuitive eating, it's also important to um, not use exercise as punishment, not using exercise to make up for what you just ate or because you have to, to punish yourself or because you have to look a certain way, but really moving your body in ways that feel good to you and moving your body in ways that are fun to you. So if you enjoy um, just doing things that you enjoy rather than things that are meant to um, meant to alter your body in some way. So how do we help children reconnect with intuitive eating? Um, it's important to give children options and aim for balance. So know that all foods fit. Like I said, there's room for um, all types of foods. And it's actually um, something I like to tell my clients is no food will harm you more than your eating disorder will. So eating a donut, I'm just looking at the picture, that's often a demonized food. It's healthier to eat a donut um, than to be so afraid of a donut, to avoid going out to breakfast with friends and to avoid life because you're so afraid of, of eating this food or have, being around this food. So it's important to let children have all, all types of foods, let them decide what they like, what feels good in their body. Um, consistent exposure to a variety of foods and um, this one can be challenging, but letting them eat or not eat, it's up to them to a default. So if they're restricting and it's problematic and they're not eating anything, that would be different. But if it's mealtime and they say they're not hungry, listen to them and maybe the, and let them eat a little bit later. Um, again, ha having saying like, okay, you have to sit at the table with us because you're not getting out of mealtime. But if you're not hungry now, um, I'll leave it. I'll leave it here to heat up for when you are hungry. So letting them really um, navigate their their cues. Um, and it's interesting. You'll children will let you know when they're full, and they'll let you know when they're hungry. Um, and as adults, it's it can be really freeing to get back to that. Um, just being aware of your own language and internal biases and internal dialogue around food. So being aware of how you talk about different foods. Um, like calling things bad foods or junk foods, those aren't really helpful. Notice how I call them play foods um, and really not demonizing foods in any way. So just being aware of how you're talking about these foods around, around children. Um, another philosophy to adopt is health at every size. Health at every size is a philosophy of promoting overall well-being as a measure of health and not the number on the scale. Um, we live in a society that it sees someone in a certain uh, in a larger body and says they're not healthy or see someone in a smaller body and they say oh they're healthy that couldn't be farther from the truth um the um, anyone can be healthy can be taking care of their body can be moving their body 
and a lot, our body size is largely determined by genetics. So um, it's important to accept the diversity of body shapes and sizes and to be weight inclusive. Um, I really like this video if you ever want to check it out. It's called Poodle Science and it really helped me understand the health at every size philosophy. Um, basically, in, it talks about the different types of um, different types of dogs, and we never try to turn a um, like a, a chocolate lab. We never try to turn a chocolate lab into a poodle. We never try to make the, a chihuahua. We never try to change their bodies. We accept dogs for the diversity of their body shapes, sizes, also their their color, um, and that's how it should be as humans. Um, so really accepting all body sizes um, and rejecting that idealization or pathologizing of specific weights. So with health at every size philosophy, it, it really goes off of if you're taking care of your body, you're focusing on your social relationships, your spirituality, um, all the other things that contribute to health and not just the number on the scale. Um, just thinking of time. Just quickly, a uh, body mass index is something that we often hear about. Um, doctors may tell you your body mass index, they may tell children their body mass index, and it's important to know that this number is not the end all be all, and it's actually really unhelpful. This um, BMI was invented by a statistician in the 1800s to really group, um, to, like, group uh, populations together. Um, and it really took off in the medical field as something that is, is a way to like um, kind of tell people they're if they're overweight or quote unquote obese. And that's just a screening tool and cannot be used to measure um, someone's health. So if they just a lot of times um, someone will go someone in a larger size body will go to a doctor and the doc like for like a broken foot and the doctor will automatically just attribute it to their BMI or their body size and that can that is really unhealthy um, and we know that BMI doesn't take into consideration body composition or muscle mass, gender, so professional athletes um, who are muscular and um, they will often come on the really high end of body mass index and so they would be quote like identified as unhealthy but they're actually very active taking care of their bodies um, so it's really not something to um, to focus on, especially with children. If they hear their BMI is is overweight or larger in a larger, they're in a larger body, um, it doesn't mean that they're unhealthy, and doesn't mean that that's what should define them um, in terms of their health. So overall, it's important that we as caregivers and parents expose children to greater representation of all humans and challenge the concept of the ideal body. Um, it's important to promote a uh, positive body image and build self-esteem. So when you're focusing um, on health with your children, focus on their overall health instead of their weight. Help them develop an identity that's beyond their external appearance. Focus on their internal qualities, which make them um, just the amazing humans that they are. So letting them know like, you're so helpful, um, you're so helpful to mommy, or you're just such a funny kid, and, and focusing on those internal qualities about them um, rather than focusing on their external appearance. And assist them in adopting healthy behaviors that don't focus on weight. So um, encouraging them to move their body because they want to, because it's fun, um, because it's good for them, um, not because they have to be a certain weight or be a certain size also create a zero tolerance policy for shaming others based on their weight or appearance. We know how harmful this is, teaching kids that it's not okay to shame people for their weight or appearance, just like you probably teach them to not shame them for a disability or shame them because of their skin color. Weight really needs to be a part of that conversation. Um, also model positive behaviors for children. I've talked about this a lot throughout the presentation, so I won't go into this, um, and teaching them, teach them management and coping skills. So if you're noticing any of these like physical changes or behaviors or psychological symptoms in your children or someone that you know, um, it's important to seek professional help as early as possible. So if you start observing any of the eating disorder behaviors or seeing body changes or noticing their change in mood, um, and it's atypical for a teenager, it's maybe more intense, um, or if you need support, please reach out and, and 
get help. The Alliance is here for, for you. Um, for if you just have questions, like I said, or if you want to um, learn more, or if you can always reach out to us, reach out to your physician or any therapist. Um, I'm not going to go through this because we have five minutes left, but um, I will, so I will see, let's see if it's important to go through. I just wanted to say um, families are not to blame and actually can be the patient's and provider's best allies in treatment. There's a stereotype like in the past that it, um, families cause eating disorders. That's not true. Um, that's not the case. So um, really, if you're um, someone is struggling with an eating disorder in your family, I don't want you to feel shame. It's important to reach out and get support. It's nobody's fault. Um, it's not a family's fault at all. Um, and in terms of treatment, families know families know the, the client better than anybody else. So they can be really helpful in treatment. And truth number nine, full recovery from an eating disorder is possible. Um, this is sort of different than with substance use. They say like you'll be in recovery for your whole life. We actually know that you can recover from an eating disorder. Um, it's not to say that major triggers or life events can't, they'll, they'll pop up and eating disorder thoughts may come back, but it's possible to go um, to live a life without an eating disorder. And early detection and intervention are important. So if you do suspect someone is struggling with food or with their body, it's important to, to get them help as soon as you can. Um, this is the contact information for the National Alliance for Eating Disorders. Um, you can go to our website, call our hotline, send us an email, um, follow us on social media, um, but we are here for as a resource for you all.